H-A-Y-S. I, uh, I'm a city kid. I grew up in Pomona, California. My father worked at Lockheed Aircraft. My mother was a nurse. When I was a high school student, I got to visit my uncle as a agricultural consultant. I liked what he did as a job. I went to the library, I read a book about it, and I said, that's exactly what I want to do. Today, that's exactly what I do. My story begins in Pomona. When I was a high school student, I went to Mount San Antonio College and took an agriculture class as a senior. And then I applied and was accepted at Cal Poly. And I was a student at that time in the plant and soil science department. My specialty was citrus fruit production. And I was also very interested in insects and pest management. So as a student, I got a license to become a pest control advisor. This is a state license that allows you to give people advice on how to deal with pest management problems. And that has been, that was the start of my career. I have worked for a couple different companies directly with farmers. I've worked for an aerial application company that sprayed with helicopters. Today, I work mostly with farmers in the upper desert area. I consult and advise on alfalfa production, apple, organic apple production, olives, small grains, onions, a little bit of citrus. I've worked with peaches and uh, other tree crops in the past. So Neville asked me to come and talk to you to give you a, a look at modern agriculture and parts of it and how we deal with some of the issues. I come at this from a standpoint of being a scientist. I think of myself as a student of science. The symbol of scholarship is the lantern, right? And what we want to do is we want to bring light to the issues. We want to bring understanding, knowledge, truth. We want to replace superstition, fear, paranoia. And the way we want to do that is we want to look at science behind things and then see how it works in the real world. When I got into this line of work, the last thing I ever thought w was that it would be controversial. And yet I find myself constantly in the center of a storm of controversy. But I have a very unique perspective because I see it from the bottom and the sides. And I see it probably different than most of you will. So I ask you today, I'm not gonna ask you to agree with me and I hope we can have a dialogue. As we go through this, if you have questions, raise your hand and we'll be glad to talk about it. So let's approach it with an open mind. So we're gonna to talk today about something I call a look at IPM. What is IPM? What does that mean? Integrated Pest Management. Where did it come from? Anybody know that? Okay. Believe it or not, it came from the desert. And it, and it really funny, it came from Inkley. And I know because the person who's the father of IPM was an entomology professor at UC Riverside. There were several people that are responsible for this. One of them is a man named Dr. Vernon Stern. He was working on trying to control the spotted alfalfa aphid in fields near Hinkley. And at that time, they were trying to develop insecticides and they realized it didn't work. You can't control insects with just chemicals. It will fail. It always has and it always will. He discovered that you had to have a complete integrated program. You had to use some chemicals, but you also had to use natural enemies. You had to change your cultural practices of how you farm. You had to put this all together into an integrated concept. And he wrote a paper, you can find it on the internet. It's called the Integrated Control Concept. That's the Old Testament of integrated pest management. He laid out all the 
principles of using selective pesticides, using resistant varieties, introducing natural enemies, and coming up with a complete program. Since that paper was written, that went from a sort of outlandish theory to today where it is standard practice. It is the principal way we manage pests today. It's the most effective, the most economical, the most sustainable. So we're gonna look at an IPM program and I chose to take a crop. There are IPM programs for virtually every crop. Some of these are very formalized. Some of them are developed through the universities. They're widely available. In California, the University of California publishes manuals on the various crops. So I chose one of the crops I work with, apples. So let's talk about apples. How did, where did apples come from? They probably came from Asia and parts of the Middle East. They were widely grown in Europe and they traveled around the world because people like apples. When they brought apples to America, they brought the plants, but they also brought some pests. What's the key pest of apples? Most of you, I bet in your life, have probably not eaten an apple with a worm in it. When I was a kid, about every seven or eighth apple you cut open would have a worm in it. What worm is that? The coddling moth, okay? What's a coddling moth? That's a coddling moth. It's a little, small, sort of indescript gray and brown moth. It comes at night and it lays its eggs on the apples. The eggs hatch, the little worm eats into the apple, feeds inside of the apple and does terrible damage. There can be three to five generations per season. This insect evolved with the apple and it's almost a perfect match. It lays its first eggs when the apples are very small. As the apple grows, the cuddly moth grows. Later in the season, it comes again. And in a severe year, by the end of the year, every single apple can have a worm in it. This is the larval stage. That's an apple with coddling moth damage. It's, it's basically worthless. It doesn't store good. Some people say, well, you know, it's not a big deal. It's a big deal. It's a disaster. So how do you stop this? Well, up until about the Civil War, you didn't stop it. You just grew apples and you threw away a lot of them and you were always careful when you ate them to see what you were getting. But people sort of dreamed of maybe we could grow apples one day without the worms. And in the later 1800s, people began experimenting on ways to control insects. And they started putting things on trees to stop them. Now in those days, one of the first insecticides used, they wanted things that were dangerous and they used arsenic, which is kind of crazy, right? It's really poisonous. It did kill the bugs, except it made the fruit pretty dangerous too. In the early 1900s, they started developing techniques to spray, to put chemicals on the trees. They developed a product called lead arsenate, two bad things that was sprayed on apples. And the idea was you coated the apples with this chemical, so when the coddly moths came to lay their eggs, it would be there to kill the little worms. So they said, well, how do we, how do, we do this? How do we make this work? Well, they came up with a great idea that as soon as the little apples formed after blooming, they would start spraying lead arsenate. And they would spray every 10 days because the apples are growing, so they got to keep it coated. So they would spray these apples 10 or 12 times a season. And if you were a good farmer, you kept your fruit coated with that lead arsenate. Now they knew it was dangerous. So 
When they picked the apples, they would wash them to try to wash it off the skin. And it sort of worked. They still got damage, and they didn't kill very many people with the lead arsenate. But over time, the problem started developing. The first problem was the trees started getting sick. The trees were being poisoned by the arsenic in the spray. We have fields today that still have arsenic in soil from that time period. So they said, this is not good. We got to do something else. So that gets us kind of up to the 1930s. In 1934, a German scientist discovered a new chemical, DDT. DDT became the first commercial insecticide. It was first, what was the first use of DDT? Does anybody know that? No history students here? Okay, what was the first thing that was treated with DDT? Soldiers, people. It was done in Italy, Naples, Italy, 1943. And it was done to prevent a disease outbreak. And they dusted, you might have seen in a movie where they stick a hose down a lady's dress and give her a blast of white powder. That was DDT dust. Now the truth was that DDT is not very dangerous for people. It is not an acute toxin. It does accumulate in fat tissue and it accumulates in the environment. At that time, that wasn't well understood. But it did, it was a fantastic insecticide. So after the war, they began to develop um, uses for this product. One of them was they started spraying crops with it. And apples was one of the first crops that got sprayed. They discovered that DDT was incredibly effective on cotton moth. So it became widely adopted, widely used. They still did this business of spraying all the time. Now also in World War II, they discovered nerve gas. Nerve gas led to the discovery of another group of insecticides called the organophosphates. These chemicals are highly toxic, much more toxic than the DDT family, but they don't persist in the environment. They rapidly break down. So they started spraying DDT, got good control of the codling moth, but after a short period of time, they also developed a technique of spraying. This machine is called a speed sprayer or an air blast sprayer. It blows air with a spray through the trees. This is how apples are sprayed. So when they started spraying DDT, it killed the coddling moths. Everybody was happy. Then the trees started turning yellow. Leaves were speckled. Something was happening, not good. What, what is that? Spider mites, excellent. Spider mites. There are arachnids in the arachnid family. They scar the leaves and feed on the, the green tissue in the leaves. They can, if it's bad, it can cause a tree to drop all of its leaves and it's really bad for the tree. Why did spider mites become bad when they sprayed DDT? They killed off the natural enemies, the things that were eating spider mites. Before that time, spider mites were virtually unheard of as a pest. But the DDT era created, turned them into a really bad pest problem. And then a short time later, something else happened. The DDT quit working. The insects became resistant to it. So they had to switch to the organophosphates. The first organophosphates they used were, one of them was a chemical called parathion. Parathion is incredibly toxic. I personally have worked with it in the old days. Today it's illegal. But a half of a teaspoon spilled on your skin, if you don't wash it off, will kill you. Okay, that's how toxic it is. The good part of parathion is, if you spill it on the ground, you come back in a couple weeks, you can't find it because it's chemically broken down. And it breaks down on plant tissue. So we could spray it on plants, 
Even though it's that dangerous, in about two or three weeks, it's gone. It kills the bugs, it goes away. So it also killed codling moth. It was used. And then another type of product called Guthion replaced Parathion. Guthion became the standard apple spray material. Highly effective on codling moth. And later on, they've discovered if they used less of it, they didn't have trouble with spider mites all the time. So the, uh, in the 60s and up into the 70s, they were spraying pretty constantly and getting pretty good results. But they still had trouble with mites and then some other insects would develop that we call secondary pests. You're not, they're normally not a problem, but when you spray, you get rid of their natural enemies and then they become a problem. So some of the farmers and scientists said, maybe this idea of spraying all the time isn't such a good idea. What if we could spray just when we need to? How would we do that? We know that the coddling moth comes from a moth. It lays its eggs, it becomes a worm in the fruit. It eats in the fruit. It crawls out on the tree, spins a cocoon and becomes an adult then goes and lays eggs again. What if we could figure out when it was laying those eggs and spray right there just at that time instead of having to try, try to keep the fruit covered all the time? And they said, well, to do that, we have to know when the moths are there. How can we do that? <laughs> so there was research being done in the 60s and early 70s on products called pheromones. Pheromones are how insects communicate. There are chemicals that insects give off in their bodies to tell other insects what to do. Have you ever watched ants take a line? The line may curve, it may go funny places. How do they do that? Why do they do that? The ants are depositing pheromones when they walk. Little tiny chemical drops mark the trail. All the other ants use their antenna, say, oh, there's the trail, and they follow it. Okay, how do girl coddling moths find boy coddling moths? Guess what? Pheromones. On a night in the spring, when it's 62 degrees at sunset, female coddling moth emits pheromone, a mating pheromone. And the boy coddling moths are flying around. They pick it up with their antennas. They play a game of hotter and colder. And they fly around until they find each other. When they find each other, they mate. Female lays eggs. That's how you get wormy apples. So some very smart scientists who understood high-tech chemistry and grass cr chromatography came up with an idea. Let's take a female moth, put her in a chamber, take the air from that chamber, which should contain that pheromone, and we'll put it in some special little tiny glass beads and we'll catch it. Then we'll chemically analyze it and maybe we could make it in the lab. They did that. So they extracted the air, chemically identified the pheromone chemical. They went in a lab, high, very high-tech chemistry. They made the same chemical in the lab. They took it out in an orchard, hung a little bit of it in a tree. Guess what? All the boy moths flew right there. They thought they were on a date. They were disappointed. So some of the scientists said, wow, this is really exciting. Think of what we can do with this. So they said, the first thing we want to do is we want to make a trap. We will make a trap. We can hang in the trees. We'll put a little bit of pheromone inside of it. And that we will check it. And that will tell us when the moths are flying, when egg laying is going to occur, 
and we'll know when to spray. This is a commercial pheromone trap. This is inside of the trap. That little thing that looks like a pencil eraser, it's a little piece of rubber that is impregnated with the pheromone. Inside the trap, it's sticky. Poly moths fly in, they get stuck on the trap. You go out there every day, you look in the trap, nothing. All of a sudden, it's full of moths. It's time to spray. They further found out if they, if they catch two or less moths per week, you don't have enough to have a problem. From two to 10, it's a pretty bad problem. If you catch more than 10 in a week, you have a severe infestation. So this could guide them on how bad the problem was. So they started using this to time their sprays. They were able to reduce the number of sprays tremendously by using this technology. So this was a giant leap ahead. Now some other scientists said, what if we go even further? What if we take that pheromone and we put it in every single tree so that no mating can occur in the entire orchard? This was an idea called mating disruption. Now, when they first suggested this, a lot of people said that'll never work. It's impossible. The pheromone emits this little chemical. How, how do you know how to put it out? How do you know it'll stay there? What if the wind blows? They said, well, we're gonna try it. About this time, their standard product, Uthion, started failing, started not working. And they'd spent a lot of money developing a whole program around using Guthion. And when Guthion wasn't gonna work, everything's gone. We're back to square one. So there was a big incentive to make mating disruption work. So they came up with a product, this little plastic strip contains the pheromone. They put it in a special plastic so that it slowly emits it over the whole growing season. So what they did is they used their traps. When they first started catching the moths, they went out and hung one or two of these in every single tree in the orchard. At first, it didn't work very good because there were too many moths. But as they gradually started getting the moths under control, when the pressure wasn't bad, this worked fabulous. Today, this is a standard method controlling Kali moths. This is how we control the moss today. Because the pheromone is made in a laboratory, there was a big debate in the organic community whether this should be allowed. Even the hardest core pro-organic people realized that if you did this, you don't have to spray the apples. This is a giant positive leap ahead. So even the hardest core organic people said, this is okay. So this is approved for use in commercial and organic production of apples and pears. Similar technology is being developed for other crops. This technology is about 10 years old. In the last few years, we've developed a product for grapes, for the, an insect called the vine mealy bug. But this is perfect, you don't spray, you don't kill the, any good bugs. You don't hurt people, birds, animals, fish. This is a brilliant, brilliant accomplishment. How many of you even knew this going on? Nobody knows about this. Okay, that's called mating disruption. And this is why today we have basically clean apples. Okay, so you hang this out in the, the trees. When the moths come out, the boy moths can't find the girl moths because this is, the this, this scent, it covers the whole orchard. So the, the boys fly here thinking they're on a date and it turns out it's not a good date. <laughs> they're just your typical confused young male. Yes. Oh, so they confused. Okay.
Now there's another technique that's used with some insects. It doesn't work with the coddling moth and it's called male annihilation. Now I know the girls might think this is a good idea, but they would put a poison chemical in the pheromone. So the males are attracted when they get close to it, it gives off the poison and kills them. Okay. They use this with some of the fruit flies. It doesn't work, seem to work with a coddling moth. Now, there's been more research on the pheromone. It turns out, this is very typical, nature's always way more complicated than we think it is. It turns out that the pheromone system It's the pheromone system with the apples and the coddling moth actually involves 13 different pheromones. The females give off 10 separate pheromones. The males, this was unknown till just a couple years ago, the males actually have three pheromones they give off to attract the females. So it's a lot more complicated than what we think. They recently included the male generated pheromone in the detection traps. Before that, you only caught boys. Now you can catch boys and girls. They're on a slightly different timetable. So it's made that more effective. Okay, so that's how we get apples. Any questions on this? I tried to explain to you here too. What we've done with pheromones is we've replaced chemicals with information with knowledge, instead of just blasting all this heavy duty chemistry out on the trees, we're using a targeted little tiny amount. Now, once in a while, we still have to spray the trees. We still have other problems, but this is a giant leap ahead. Okay, the colony moth wasn't eating the mites, but when we sprayed, we killed the enemies so the mites exploded. When we stopped spraying for the collie moth, guess what? All those good bugs came back and normally eat the mites. Okay? So we're, we're, have, we're maintaining an integrated program. We still have trouble with aphids. How do we keep aphids out of the trees? What's, what's the main thing we worry about? Ants. Ants go up in the trees and protect the aphids because they feed on, there's no other way to say it, aphid poop. Aphids are lazy eaters. They suck out the plant sap, it's high in sugar. They digest a little bit of it and they poop the rest out. It's sugar water. Ants go there and go, oh look, sugar water. And they eat it. They protect the aphids from other insects when they attack them. They're like cows for, for ants. So if you control the ants, the beneficials a lot of times will kill the aphids. So that's, that's a look at one program, just on apples, just on coddling moth. Almost every other crop, we have similar things. Citrus, almonds, pistachios. Each crop has an IPM program. There's research going on. The goal is to produce the crop using the minimum amount of chemicals, but we have to use the chemicals sometimes. If we go in an all non-chemical approach, it usually doesn't work. Now the farmer I work with has 300 acres of apples. He's the largest organic grower in California. He does mating disruption. He has a special consultant who just monitors the coddling moth. And once in a while, we start catching some, and we may have to spray uh, an approved organic treatment to suppress them. There's a disease spray, and there's a kind of a natural uh, poison that kills them. But we've only had to use that a couple of times in very distant spots. So this program's been very effective. Okay, we'll move on to the next crop. Yeah, we're doing for time, 9.30, perfect. The next crop we're gonna talk about is corn. 
Corn has always been one of my favorite crops, even though I'm a fruit guy. When I was in high school, I read a book on corn and I've been fascinated with it ever since. I've worked with it in the field. It's, it's an amazing plant. It's the most important crop in the United States. It's the most valuable single crop. Where did corn come from? Mexico. And in fact, it came from one plant that in Mexico is protected by a national park. The plant corn came from is called, I didn't write it down, Teosinete. It's a grass plant. If you looked at it, you'd say, what's the big deal? That's not corn. It's kind of a tall plant. The seeds are on top of the plant. But the native people there ate the seeds and said, hey, this is pretty good. And over thousands of years, they kept selecting plants out of that. And what we today call corn came from those plants. Genetically, those plants are incredibly important because that's the parents of corn. That's where the DNA of corn comes from. All of our corn comes from those plants. So the native people changed corn into what we know now where the male part of the plant is on the top, the tassel, the ears form on the side, the seeds are there. Every seed has a string on it, a silk. Pollen has to come off the top, land on the silk, germinate, grow down that little string or that seed won't develop and the pollen can blow around. If you have two corn plants, the, the pollen, the male part, can come over on this plant. Then you have a plant that has two parents, crossbreed. So corn developed. The Indians and the native people recognized its value. A very amazing thing to me is today with DNA analysis, they're going back and looking at corn seed in the native peoples of the Southwest. They've discovered that corn was traded and a lot of our corn in places like Arizona and New Mexico was actually brought from Mexico through a trade system. This was a very advanced civilization and culture that valued this product tremendously there was a big city, which today we call Chaco Canyon, where thousands of people lived distributing corn seed. So corn was widespread, widely grown. It became very important. And over the years, they learned that it needs water, it needs nutrients, and it needs to grow without weeds. Weeds compete and reduce the yield. So corn was uh, spread across the country when the Great Plains of the United States was turned into farmland. Corn grew very well there. It produced large yields and really fed the world. Not much else happened with corn. It, they continually tried to select it and make it better. They started looking at crossbreeding, making sure it had two different parents. Eventually they developed hybrid corn. This is where you would plant two different kinds of corn. You come over on these plants and you cut the tops off. So the pollen has to come from this corn over to this corn. That, everything there would have two parents. It's a hybrid, comes from two different sources. That would be called a single cross hybrid because it had two parents. Then they said, let's do a double cross. Let's do one here with two parents, and another different one over here with two different parents. And then we'll use those two and combine them. Now you have four parents in one seed. Hybrid plants were more vigorous, produced better yields. A man named Henry Wallace developed a company called Pioneer Seed Company, still in business today. He became very famous, very wealthy, eventually became vice president of the United States because of the success of hybrid corn. Hybrid corn is still essential, widely used today. The next transformation of the genetics of corn was to directly put genes into corn seed. 
genetic engineering. The products of genetic engineering are called GMOs, genetically modified organisms. So if you think about this, let's think about from a science standpoint. I know GMOs are very controversial. Let's think about the science standpoint. What are we really talking about? We're talking about DNA, the genetic material in the corn. The original people did a process of selection. They went out and looked and said, I like that plant and I don't like this plant. So I'm gonna save the seeds of this one. If you do that over and over, you slowly get better plants. Then that brings us up to breeding, actually picking the plants and saying, let's take the pollen from that and bring it over here. That, that speeds up the process of improvement tremendously. And then finally, where we are today is, we know which genes make the plants perform or do the things we want. And we can simply say, put that gene in the plant. Now I said, well, how do you how do you do that? How do you put a gene in a plant? Well, I was very lucky. I got to go on a field trip to St. Louis to a company that's very uh, controversial today. That was Monsanto. I got to go in their labs and see this actually done. And the guy says, oh, we use a gene gun. A gene gun? What the heck's a gene gun? Believe it or not, it's a little tiny microscopic device takes a gene and inserts it in the nucleus, literally, of what they want. In this building, there's 3,000 people working from around the world. There were scientists from India, Egypt, China, everywhere. In this building, they have growth chambers. You can go in any chamber, they can turn the dials, they can make it the jungle in Burma, they can make it the Sahara Desert, they can make it Northern Europe. They can adjust the light, the rainfall, the temperature cycle to be anywhere in the world to test their plant. Recently, they paid a billion dollars for a company that only had 12 employees that gathers weather data from around the world. Their goal is to produce corn seed that's custom fit for every possible place on earth using this data. This is how high tech this has become. Okay. So how do we grow corn? This is a modern multi-row corn planter. The ground is prepared. The seeds are in the yellow hoppers. It's planted two inches deep in the ground. In the Midwest, corn should be planted on May the 10th. Not on the 9th, not on the 11th, but on May the 10th. Every day you're off from that, your yields are less. And you see in this picture, this corn is being planted on ridges. Okay, this is, some people like this because if it rains, the water runs off in the ridges and the plants can stay dry. This is traditional weed control. The corn comes up, you drive a tractor over it, with a device called a cultivator. Stirs up the soil, kills the weeds. A couple of problems. You can't kill weeds in a row because the plants are there. And when the soil's stirred up and it rains, what happens? Washes away. So about 30 years ago, they started working on killing weeds with chemicals, big time in corn. This is a sprayer applying a herbicide over the top. This is a field very typical of today in the Midwest. About 95% of the corn is grown with a system called non-hillage. We don't plow the soil. That notion of the guy walking with a horse, forget it, it's over. They leave the crop residue on the ground. You see this, this is dead stalks of corn and soybeans that were grown in this field previously. They have a special planter that cuts through this, drops the seed in, rain comes, all of this dead plant matter protects the soil, but doesn't wash away. And if weeds grow, you kill them with chemicals. 
Why did farmers plow their fields? In the 1930s and 40s, this was a giant controversy. There were some people who came out and they were considered heretics because they said, you don't have to plow your fields. We always plow. My grandfather plowed. The ancient people plowed. Everybody plowed. What do you mean we don't have to plow? They said, what does plowing do? You turn soil over. Yeah, so it can blow away and wash away. When you turn it over, the organic matter burns up so it gets depleted. The only advantage in plowing was killing weeds. Killing weeds is the only real function of tillage of working the soil, other than being able to get the seeds in the ground. So they said, what if we made a planter that just puts the seeds in just where we want and leave the rest alone? That caught on, and today, this system called non-tillage is the dominant way we grow corn. It protects the soil. This is why we don't have a dust bowl. This, is, this reduces erosion. In many of our crops today, even our tree crops, we don't till the soil. Citrus orchards, apple orchards, the apple orchard I work with, they hate to work the soil because it's bad for the trees. So corn farming, it's very important that you control the weeds so it's easy to harvest. This is a large combine harvesting. Corn also has insect problems. This is the corn earworm. It eats the seeds on the corn. If you buy sweet corn, open it up in the store, you'll see, you might see a worm eating it. That's the corn earworm. They've been able to genetically engineer seeds that they don't attack certain varieties. Here's corn growing infested with weeds. So how do we deal with that? What do we do? We would spray it. And we have two options. We can use a selective herbicide that doesn't kill corn but would kill the weeds. Or we can use GMO corn that's been modified to be able to survive a herbicide. The most famous one is Roundup. You can spray it right over the top. It kills everything, but the corn's been modified so it survives the wheat die. Here's a great picture. Look at the, this is where the weeds are bad. Look how stunted the corn is compared to over here. This is why we have to have GMO. Because of this weed competition. If we allow these weeds to grow, we won't have any food. It's not that we're trying to create Franken food or mess with everybody. This is about the ancient practice of controlling weeds. We don't have enough people with hoes to kill those weeds. We don't have enough tractors. We don't have enough diesel fuel. We don't have enough cultivators. Chemical control of weeds is one of the most essential things in our society that nobody knows about. So when people complain about GMOs, my first question is, do you understand the importance of weeds and how important weed control is? And how would we do it without it? Now, there are problems with this whole technology. There's a lot of weeds, a lot of weeds, different kinds of weeds. When we use one product over and over, the first thing we do is a process called selection, where we kill the weeds that are easy to kill and we leave the bad weeds. The bad weeds multiply because they don't have any competition. The other problem is resistance, where a weed that could be controlled over time becomes resistant and can't be controlled. This was one of the things in the Roundup system that they did not foresee. They didn't believe it would happen as quick as it has. So the answer to this is you have to develop new products or use different ones. So that's why we have GMOs. Okay. Any questions on that? That's a good question. I believe the first one was in corn and it was the Roundup Ready trait, the ability 
of a plant to survive Roundup. Now, Roundup herbicide, Roundup's a trade name, the chemical is called glyphosate. It was developed by a scientist to attack a chemical pathway in the metabolism of the plant. He said, I'm gonna design a product that attacks this one spot with the idea that we could change that. That eventually we could make a crop and we could put the gene in it so that it would survive that. So it was actually designed for that purpose. So the Roundup Ready corn was developed, tested, it was done through universities. It worked and they started realizing how, what a great tool it was. The other thing with Roundup is that it kills perennial weeds, really bad weeds. It goes in, goes down through the root system and kills all of them. The other thing about Roundup that a lot of people don't know about or don't understand is Roundup is actually two amino acids put together. So when you spray it on the soil, it's immediately tied up and germs in the soil go, oh look, carbon bonds, let's eat it. And it's broken down quickly. You can spray Roundup, farmers spray Roundup and plant seeds the same day in that soil. Those seeds grow fine. It has no soil residue, breaks down, it's not toxic to people. I'll take a chance here and I'll be controversial. The state of California just issued an opinion that Roundup might be dangerous. That is based on junk science from Europe. This is one of the most researched products in human history, and it's consistently been proven to be safe. There's no question about its safety. There may be questions about its use, economics, the, the business decisions about it, but in terms of safety, the safe product. Any other questions, comments, disagreements? I'll, I'll ask the question that Sarah should ask. First of all, uh, pushback, the main pushback against GMO is that it causes health issues in, in humans. You just said that it's well recent. That's not true. Can you back that up a little bit? How, how do we know that that's not true and the stuff we see on the internet isn't Okay, when this was suggested, immediately the scientists said, oh my goodness, this is something really new. We've got to be really careful. So they conducted years and years of feeding trials, metabolism trials, all kinds of trials about testing its safety to the people that ate the crops. None of that showed any harmful effects. We have been eating these products now for about 15 years. Recently, the National Institute of Health came out and said, we have found no problem. One of my favorite checks is Wikipedia. I look at Wikipedia as a scientist and I say, what does the public see about our science? What are they, what are they getting? Go to Wikipedia, look up GMO. Big, long article, full of the controversy. But one of the first things it says is, the human health effects of GMO are not harmful. Most of the controversy involves the economics business decision, questions of, for example, Monsanto spent a billion dollars to develop this corn seed. Do they have a right to own that seed? Can they patent that seed? Can they say, we own this seed. If you want this seed, you have to pay us to buy it. That went all the way to the Supreme Court. They said, yes, you can do that. It's called intellectual property rights. It was a big expansion into a kind of a new area. Other people say, no, they can't own seeds. Seeds are for everybody. We used capitalism, we used free market economics to say, okay, wait a minute. If you're a farmer, you can plant any seed you want. 
You can buy non-GMO, you can plant your grandfather's old seed, you can do anything you want. But this company wants to offer you this product that's greatly improved. The deal is you have to sign a contract that says you'll buy the seed from them, number one, then number two, that you won't sell that seed to somebody else or give it away or even keep it. And that's how it works. So if you grow genetically modified crops, you sign a contract that says I'll buy your seed, I'll grow the crop, and I will sell the seed in regular channels. But it's free will. Nobody's forced to buy it or use it. In the corn market, genetically modified seed today represents about 94% of the seed. It's massively popular because it's very productive. In cotton seed, it's about 96%. In soybeans, it's about 90%. Those are the main crops. Recently, we got Roundup Ready alfalfa. We have Roundup Ready sugar beets. In the box, they have Roundup Ready lettuce, Roundup Ready tomatoes, some other crops. They have, those crops have not been released. They don't think the public, they don't want to fight the public battle at this time. How many of you eat a papaya, have eaten a papaya say, in the last five years? Okay. Every single papaya is a GMO. All the regular papayas died. The only ones you can eat have been modified so that they survive a virus disease. Yeah, <laughs> your question is about a topic we call gene flow. How do you keep those genes in your field and not go on to the neighbor? The, the short answer is when they produce the seed, it's produced in isolation, and um, there is a chance, but it requires other plants, and there's been very little transfer from that field. And say you're a corn farmer, you buy GMO seed, your neighbor doesn't. You both plant the seed, there's no pollen flow um, uh, during the, the crop development. Uh, Monsanto had a chance to install what was called a lethal gene. They were concerned about this and they, they were concerned that people would steal their seed. So they wanted to put a gene in it that the third time you tried to reproduce it, it would kill the plants. It was called the death gene. Even Monsanto said, no, we're not gonna do that. <laughs> That's too dangerous. So they didn't do that. But there, to date, the gene flow issue has been minor, but it does, it's, it's possible. The Hawaii question, I don't know what you're so talking about. I can, I can kind of address the Hawaii thing. The Hawaii thing, what, what happens in this conversation is a lot of different discussions going on actually about different things. The thing that I saw in Hawaii, I saw, I saw a, a PBS documentary on it. It was an example of, I think because of the great growing season in Hawaii, they choose Hawaii, Monsanto, and other seed companies to do the field trial to actually develop it. And they happen, for whatever stupid reason, to be so then they're going to test which pesticides work and which don't, right? And those pesticides were blowing onto communities, local white. And that's a social justice issue that several companies, such as Monsanto, have been slow to realize. Don't get to put this in some rural area and then potentially expose people, especially, especially more, it's just for the best privilege people to pesticide blow off. But those, that's not the GMO, that then becomes GMO seed. That's actually the testing process for the GMOs. The pesticides work and don't work.
just a simple answer to that. So that conversation tends to come over to, and you phrased the question very beautifully, to say Monsanto is big, bad, and ugly. First of all, they're not the only seed company. There's many others, others doing this. And that was a, a specific test case that I picked up at the end that they, they started to remedy and say, okay, let's not put this in a, put these test plots in a place where they could be potentially damaged uh, human health. Is, is that the same scenario you, you watched? Yeah. Uh, Tim, I, I'm going to give it, do you have a question? I don't know. I don't know. That's, I just I don't work with bananas. I know there's a lot of constant development of new varieties, so they're constantly changing a little bit. Um, your Hawaii question also brings up another topic, and that's the whole business of modern ag technology in the third world, specifically pesticides. We have a problem. The problem is there can be great benefits to using pesticides. There's an incentive to use them. But what if people use them who aren't trained, who don't understand how dangerous they are, who don't understand how to handle them properly? It's a nightmare. I've worked with farm workers from Mexico. I was at a farm one day. They brought out an insecticide called Lanate. Three of the workers screamed, Lanate, and ran out of the field. And we're going, what? What's going on here? Their friend came over and said, in their village, somebody used that and sprayed tomatoes and people died. So anytime they see that chemical, they're terrified of it. I would be too. This is one of the problems we have that we have to work on, is how do we use these things? How do we get the benefit in the third world where they're desperately needed, but do it in a responsible way? The trend in the chemical, we didn't talk about the pesticide industry, but the trend is, if you think back, we started with lead arsenate, very dangerous, very persistent, and bad for the environment. We went to DDT, which was very persistent, bad for the environment, but less dangerous. We went to the organophosphates. Now we have not persistent, not bad in the environment, but very dangerous, to today. Today we have products, new products, that only kill the insects. They don't persist in the environment. They're not dangerous to people. They just kill the targeted insects. All the new product, that's what they have to be. That's where we're going. In the third world, this will be a great thing. So can you just, uh, again, the, the, in, the, in the first one, where most of the GMOs are used, can you also just talk about your life and how how much work goes into and permitting goes into you ever being able to use pesticides in the first place? Okay. California. So if you look back at pesticides, there was a recent program on Rachel Carson, the author of Silent Spring. When chemical pesticides were introduced after World War II, they were widely used with pretty recklessly because nobody knew about them. Problems developed. There were federal efforts at introducing legislation, FIFRA, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. In the state of California, they created a, a massive amount of regulations. In the early 1970s, they passed a law that said, in our state, if you sell pesticides or recommend pesticides, you must be licensed. That's what I got in on, that's what I do. Today, they're, the EPA was created. Uh, there's all kinds of other agencies. This is an incredibly highly regulated field. It costs $25 million to develop current products. It takes up to 11 years of safety testing. It's, just, it's an incredible amount of work that has to go into this. The, the, the bad effect of that is when these products are developed, they're incredibly expensive. 
The third world can't afford them. Our farmers can just barely afford them. But the technology is so good, so beneficial, that over time, it, it's becoming more and more common. So the hazards to the people, to the community, to the farm workers is constantly getting lessened, which is good. That should be what we want. Any other questions? I have one final And you talked about bees that go away from insects. But if you look at weeds, the thing that's always interested me is you've got two choices. You can either use a herbicide, either one of these very selective, very targeted herbicides, or we can use a herbicide with a GMO. GMO product that is herbicide. Talk about that a little bit because if I don't plant GMO and I use herbicide, how much more herbicide do I use and how much more dangerous is that potentially to the very health effects we're talking about? Because we often get pesticide health effects that I think of very real mixed up with GMO health effects. We talk about that in one big soup. Yeah. You can try to separate that a little bit. When the GMO corn came out, before that time, weeds were being controlled with chemicals. They used a whole train load of chemicals. Atrazine, 2,4-D, uh, Lasso, Dual, just an incredible array of herbicides. These herbicides had a lot of bad effects. They would persist in the groundwater. They would go off the field, they would blow out of the field, they would kill plants in your neighbor's field that you didn't want to kill. They had a lot of side effects. When the GMO technology came out, it, for 10 years, replaced all those products. All of those other problems went away. And in fact, some people believed that that GMO technology with glyphosate was the end of weed control. Our problems are all over, and it was widely adopted. It saved a huge amount of money. It was incredibly effective, and it avoided all the environmental problems of all the other herbicides. The only monkey wrench came when weeds started developing resistance to glyphosate. So today, we look at it, and this is evolving literally as we speak. In the Midwest, there's people debating about how they're going to control weeds, what system they're going to use, what products. Most of them will use a glyphosate-based system with other herbicides. And the secret probably is to find the right mix of products and the right crop rotation so that on a long-term basis, you keep any single weed from becoming dominant in your field. I personally believe that we will have to reintroduce cultivation on a limited basis because cultivation does kill weeds with brute force, mechanical nature. Uh, there's detriments to cultivation in that the erosion is a problem. But every so often, if we do cultivate, we can take out weeds with a tractor that doesn't involve chemistry. And that's a good thing. So as a weed scientist, as a weed control advisor, I want every tool I can have. I want all the herbicides, I want cultivation, I want everything. Give me more tools. Don't take them away without a good reason. The latest thing in the GMO field is to develop crops. This corn is being introduced right now that's resistant to two herbicides not just Roundup, Roundup and something else. One program you may see advertised on TV and you'll go, what are they talking about? It's called Enlist Duo. Enlist Duo is a technology that incorporates resistance to Roundup and Dicamba, another herbicide, in the same seed. Dicamba is a powerful herbicide against weeds that are resistant to Roundup. Now I hope they've learned their lesson. There's no one
product that solves all the problems. One of the challenges in the future, and you should understand this as a job opportunity, is to learn about this technology and how to manage it. If you can identify weeds, if you can understand how herbicide works, you can be useful to farmers. You might have a job. That could be your job. Did you ever think about that? Okay. Pest control advisor is considered one of the most emerging and, and, and needed jobs in any field in, in health right now. And that's the general category of what yeah. There's a tremendous need in my field. We have an association called CAPA, CAPCA, California Association of Pest Control Advisors. You can go check their website. They actually have a program called Pathway to PCA which is how you would go to school to get my job. For PCAs in California, our average age is 65. You're one of the, Ridiculous. You're one of the kids. I, I'm a kid, because I, I just turned, literally just turned 63. But there's a tremendous opportunity. There's only about 4,000 people licensed to do what I do in California. We don't have enough. We went through a long period where nobody wanted to study this in college. Today, we're kind of playing catch up. I was just at Cal Poly with my grandson. I'm trying to get him interested in this. And they told me that their plant science department right now, they have a big list of people that want to, want to study. So people are starting to catch on. I would tell you this is a wonderful field to work in. If you like being outside, you like being your own boss, um, and you like the technology and you're not afraid, you can't be afraid of bees or snakes or hard work, but it's a lot of fun. And some of the projects I've got to work on, how many of you saw Aaron Brockovich? A couple of you, okay. That's about groundwater contamination in Hinkley. What are they doing about that contamination? How are they fixing that? through farming. They're pumping that water out and using it to grow crops. Well, this is, there's all kinds of issues involved in this. I'm one of the people that's an advisor on that project. You got to be visiting that on your to maybe going to come along on, on, the, on the ride. Sure. So, you know, I just want to thank you very, very much. Okay. Uh, I, I would just finish by saying we got 7.6 billion in growing and we've got to figure out a way to feed all the people. So if you want to find an area where you're actually, no matter which, like Tim said, which side of the coin you come from, but an area where you can really make a difference, um, this, is, this is definitely one of them. Thank I'd, you very, very much. I'd like to plug a couple things too. Um, one of my main crops I work with is alfalfa. If you go on the internet to the California Alfalfa Work Group, website. This is a site run by the University of California. There's all kinds of information on alfalfa. Every year they have a conference called the Symposium. And the last three years they've taped this conference. Two of those years I gave talks there. I have a talk that's on the internet at that site about solving problems and growing alfalfa. If you're interested in being a pest control advisor, check out CAPCA and then talk to uh, your advisors. Basically, to be in a PCA, you must have a bachelor's degree or equivalent for your degree in agriculture or biological science. You must take certain classes. You must pass a test from the state. Um, there's information on that at CAPCA about how to do that if you're interested in this. I think it's a great field and I want to also emphasize, I'm a city kid. I grew up in Pomona, never on a farm. When I went to Cal Poly, I learned to drive tractors, weld, do farm stuff, hang out with farm people, but I also knew chemistry and physics and algebra. 
and some engineering and put all those things together and walked out of there with a bachelor's degree. I had six job offers when I graduated. I've never been unemployed and I've gotten pick who I work for and I've got to leave a job, get a job that paid more money and is more fun. I mean, it's a tremendous opportunity and it could be yours.